Thank you. I'm just going to offer a broad contextualisation, really, of the emerging role of survivor testimony in British culture, um, specifically through the lens of Holocaust education, before Emily turns to look at how Holocaust testimony is used um, within the Imperial War Museum in London. In September 2013, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, attended a dinner organised by the Holocaust Educational Trust, a lobbying turned charitable organisation formed in 1988, which has become one of the most politically and publicly prominent educational charities in Britain. During his speech to the assembled guests, Cameron turned to praise the assembled group of Holocaust survivors who were present at the dinner. He said, one group of HET supporters without whom much of this would never have been possible who selflessly and tirelessly travel the length and breadth of the country, week in, week out, to give their testimony. <coughs> the men and women who are prepared to relive the most harrowing moments of humanity every day to preserve the memory of what happened and to teach others. Both the presence of the Prime Minister at this event and his celebration of the courageous role of survivors in the mediation of Holocaust education and their extraordinary work in support of the Holocaust Educational Trust illustrates the extent to which the face of Holocaust education in Britain has been transformed since the establishment of this organisation almost 28 years ago. Once on the periphery of engagement with the Second World War, the Holocaust has now become a substantial aspect of British students' engagement with the past, in no small part as a result of the success of the emotive educational initiatives implemented by the Trust itself including outreach programmes which bring survivors into schools to talk directly to students and also one-day visits to Auschwitz-Birkenau. From the margins of historical discussion, therefore, in Britain, some Holocaust survivors have become integral to education in Britain, to the point of which they're referred to as being the heart of Holocaust teaching. Studying the Holocaust has been a mandatory part of the Key Stage 3 education in England and Wales since the introduction of the National Curriculum in 1991. That's when pupils are aged between 11 and 14 years of age. Whilst the design of that curriculum and the particular place of history within it was a protracted and highly politicised affair, the development of Holocaust education since the 1990s has frequently been cited as a key turning point in terms of Britain's engagement with the Nazi genocide signalling a shift from the institutional silences or distortions that had characterised previous decades. Put simply and briefly, we can say that, as Andy Pearce suggests, awareness of and interest in the Holocaust was generally confused and contradictory, fluctuant and turbid in Britain, between the cessation of hostilities and the arrival of the Holocaust on the curriculum in 91. It was not that Britain was untouched or unconcerned with the Holocaust, so much as those events remain by and large on the margins in the shadows of mainstream historical culture. There were various reasons for this. The distinctive features of British war experience was a considerable factor, as was the pervasive liberal imagination in British society. Alongside this, the emergence of the Cold War and the breakup of empire, the changes to Britain's social fabric brought brought by Commonwealth and immigration, <coughs> and after the mid-1960s, a growing sense of cultural malaise. Now, if the Holocaust remained in the shadows of mainstream historical culture, then it's certainly also applicable to survivors in British society. And although recent research has come to show the idea of, in the immediate post-war years being characterised by silence and the survivor experience being sort of omitted from any historical discussion as somewhat of a distortion, it cannot be denied, particularly in popular um, memory and culture, that survivors' voices were often excluded from historical and popular narratives of the Holocaust. And there's two British publications produced in the media aftermath of the war, the Victory Book and Lest We Forget, um, and they reveal that those who actually endured persecution were often not engaged with directly, and their experiences were instead filtered and mediated through the words of those who witnessed the aftermath of these atrocities, rather than those who had experienced them directly. Despite their role in mutely articulating the result of years of persecution through the use of graphic images of emaciated survivors that dominated the British media in 1945, Tony Kushner asserts that there was no interest in the victims as such, other than to illustrate the bestiality of the perpetrators. 
And although a number of factors can be seen to have been involved in the growing prominence of the survivor and survivor testimony in British commemorative culture in the 21st century, more than in any other area in British life, it's been organisations committed to Holocaust teaching who have campaigned most consistently and most passionately to ensure that the importance of survivors and their testimony is recognised. Educational organisations tell students that survivor testimonies are powerful because they challenge the process of dehumanisation. We cannot imagine the numbers of people that suffered during the Holocaust, they say. However, we can gain some understanding by focusing on the individual stories and testimonies of those who suffered and died. By using these testimonies to encourage a focus on the individual experience, educators are trying to ensure that the victims of the Holocaust are not simply reduced to abstract figures. And it's believed that if students are able to engage with individual testimony, their understanding of human experience within an incomprehensible event can be enhanced. And the Holocaust Educational Trust refers to this focus on the individual experience and the rejection of abstract identification as a means by which they're able to restore the humanity of the survivors and to rehumanize the victims of the Holocaust. And certainly within Britain, <coughs> This has gained merit, and survivors have become the touchstone around which educational organisations have sculpted their educational rationale and their educational programmes. Yet the prominence accorded to survivor testimony by these organisations who work independently shouldn't necessarily suggest that survivor testimony is used habitually within the British classroom. Um, a recent study that I was a part of, of local state secondary schools at Sussex, revealed that Although sometimes schools did invite survivors into the classroom, um, this was actually relatively inconsistent and they never, students never engaged with survivor testimony, written survivor testimony or video recording of testimony and actually that went for the majority of primary material generally, it just wasn't something that was factored in the classroom. Of course, this doesn't, shouldn't suggest that teachers are necessarily just dismissive of testimony and its value. Indeed, a lot of the teachers we spoke to um, found that when they had listened to survivor speakers, they'd found it very emotive, their students had found it very emotive, but that there are a number of structural constraints on teachers which often has a detrimental influence on how the Holocaust is conceptualised and addressed in the classroom. Um, in Britain, what practitioners are able to teach about the subject is dependent on practical considerations, such as the amount of time they can spend, the behaviour of the class, and additional learning objectives, including in the scheme of work for that module. Um, teachers also often have very little historical knowledge of their own about the Holocaust and therefore don't necessarily have the confidence to engage with um, some of these questions and with the material in the classroom. But the main focus of what we're talking about today is how testimony is utilised by educational organisations who deliver Holocaust teaching either inside or outside the classroom, that they actively go into schools and shape what students <coughs> learn with their expertise. And in that vein, and in the vein of the sort of the overall topic of this conference, what is going to happen now with going forward in terms of British Holocaust teaching? And obviously it's apparent that the emphasis that organisations in Britain and elsewhere um, focusing so much on the survivor is reached a crossroads. It is a lot of emphasis on survivors going into schools and it's clear that for those organisations whose entire pedagogical basis has evolved and grown around the survivor experience, the very real fact that survivors <coughs> will soon be unable to go into the classroom and pass on their testimony poses a big problem. And of course this is a crossroads which is being faced by educators across the world. But for Britain, a country in many ways removed from the Holocaust, having not been occupied by the Third Reich aside from the Channel Islands, and therefore, in essence, being physically, geographically, and in popular interpretation and understanding at least, ideologically detached from the extermination sites, the sites of deportation, and the persecution of Jewish communities, the indelible connection between Britain and the Holocaust, which is often used as the justification for the centrality of the genocide in British life, and the subsequent domestication of the Holocaust narrative that is usually forged by the presence of the survivors who now live in Britain, um, the loss of these survivors and their ability to mediate the Holocaust in the classroom holds particular pertinence for this bystander nation. And some organisations have already engaged with this issue. The Jewish Museum in London, for example, now works with students through a close reading of artefacts and video testimony 
provided by Holocaust survivor Leon Greenman, who worked closely with the museum until his death in 2008, and whose story forms the basis of the Holocaust exhibition within the museum itself. But surprisingly, as was noted in the Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission report published last year, despite an awareness of survivors' imminent passing over the last sort of 10 to 15 years and the centrality of their testimony for Holocaust teaching, educational organisations in Britain that have utilised survivor testimony in their work have been relatively slow to document, record and protect survivor testimony of those, that they, those people that they work with to ensure that they're protected for future generations. So in 2015, we start seeing a turn towards sustained, sustained recording of testimony. Um, educational initiatives already underway indicate that that's not the sole way forward that organisations are considering. Um, there appears to be a move by some towards the concept of second and third generation going into schools um, to pass on their relative story. Um, ensuring that Holocaust education remains centred around the survivor's testimony through the physical presence of the speaker in the classroom. And the idea of creating an outreach session to be carried out by the children of survivors has existed since 2009, and much like the concept of facilitating survivor speakers in the educational arena, the Holocaust Educational Trust has been at the forefront of this conceptual shift towards engaging with the possibility of second generation speakers in the classroom. And it's an attempt to traverse the complex issue of how Holocaust educators should continue to mediate the lessons of the Holocaust in a time without the survivor to transmit their own testimony. Um, obviously, given the importance attributed to survivors' experiences and the desire to rehumanize the victims and to keep the memory of the Holocaust visible in present-day society, it's felt that through the children of survivors delivering their parents' testimony, the sense of living history which has been established through Holocaust survivors giving their testimony in the schools can be continued. And Karen Pollock, the chief executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust, basically asserts their position by saying, we talk about living history becoming just history. Well, that's what we're trying to prevent. Now, myself, some of my colleagues um, have expressed concerns about the historical and pedagogical issues involved in the move towards the use of second and third generation speakers in the classroom in this way, not least because in Britain this has happened in a very organic way and hasn't really been thought through um, particularly clearly. Unfortunately, we don't have the space to explore that here. But despite these concerns, the concerted effort by organisations to maintain their current educational formula based on living history through the use of children of survivors simply highlights the significant impact that survivor speakers and testimony have had in British Holocaust education and in society and reinforces just how influential the physical presence of the survivor in the classroom has become and how big a gap their absence will cause for the mediation of Holocaust education and Holocaust consciousness in the future. I'm not quite finished. Um, okay, so having explored the development of the Holocaust survival within British culture uh, and the role of uh, education in bringing the survivor to prominence in Britain, the second part of our paper considers the role of the survivor within the National Museum as an important educational tool for visiting school groups um, and the perceived uses of Holocaust testimonies within this context. So historians have traditionally approached testimony with caution highlighting holes in misunderstandings and personal recollections of the past. Testimony is still treated with distrust in the museum and used only to add a further layer of evidence to an existing narrative. This may be the result of a narrow perspective on the usefulness of testimony in historical studies, a perspective rejected by other disciplines, that is, that testimony must be corroborated through documentation, an approach that has resulted in the adoption of a perpetrator perspective within many Holocaust representations. This aspect of the paper explores the relationship between Holocaust survivor testimony within the Imperial War Museum uh, and Holocaust discourse. It addresses how testimony is used to express and support the narratives presented by the Imperial War Museum and in turn considers what this reveals about how knowledge is shaped through testimony as an expression of the values and beliefs of the society in a particular time and place. To offer a very brief background, uh, Britain's permanent National Holocaust exhibition is housed within the Imperial War Museum, a museum founded during the First World War to make sure that we never forget what it is like to live in a world torn apart by conflict. Memory of war, 
particularly of the Second World War, is inextricably linked to, the, to British national identity, which inevitably shapes and dictates how such events are remembered and memorialised. That Britain's official custodian of the history and memory of Britain at war should undertake the task of recording and preserving Holocaust testimonies demands further investigation. The 16 survivor testimonies recorded and displayed within the Imperial War Museum offer a significant departure from the conventional video testimony format championed by other organisations such as the Shoah Foundation. So the Shoah Foundation, as I'm sure you know, offer Holocaust survivors an opportunity to record their life histories as they remember them. Unscripted interviewers are expected to gently guide survivors through their own experiences, allowing the interviewee to take the lead. In contrast, the Imperial War Museum team employs independent video production company October Films, made up of documentary filmmakers Annie Dodds and James Barker, to conduct structured interviews with local London-based survivors selected from pre-existing oral history archives. From the project's inception, the Holocaust Exhibition project director, Suzanne Bargett, was convinced that film would be essential for its ability to convey the power of propaganda, to capture so vividly the confrontation between perpetrator and persecuted, and to show the very fabric of everyday life. Tasked with providing all of the films for the exhibition, October Films undertook the vital role of recording the Holocaust survivor testimonies for use within the exhibition's final display. The selected Holocaust survivors were interviewed by James Barker, who actively shaped the recollections provided by the witness to ensure certain key words and phrases could be incorporated. The purpose of the footage was not to record the survivor's life story, but to select relevant aspects of life stories that could be used to illustrate points throughout the exhibition. This is an important point when we consider the roles, uses and functions of Holocaust survivor testimonies within this institutional context. The aims and intentions of the museum have a radical impact on the shaping of testimonies for present and future use and understanding, and this points to an urgent need to fully consider the context and framing of survivor testimonies. We need to explore not only the testimonies themselves, but also the discourses that shape them. When discussing testimony within a National Museum of Modern Warfare in Britain, such discourses become intertwined with notions of national memory and national identity. Though it was not immediately clear what format or position the visual element would take within the Imperial War Museum, October Films remained convinced that survivor testimony should hold a central position within the display. During the planning stages for the Holocaust exhibition, despite the now prominent position of the Holocaust survivor in Holocaust memory and culture in Britain, Suzanne Bargett describes some trepidation at utilising survivor testimony at all. Testimony, she claimed, was used successfully within documentaries such as Lawrence Reese's The Nazis A Warning From History. This is a documentary that had quite a significant influence on the design of the exhibition. She was unconvinced of its usefulness within the context of a museum exhibition. There was concern over whether visitors would believe survival was the norm for victims of the Holocaust, or that the images of elderly survivors would jar with visitors as they listened to childhood memories. Suzanne Bargett wanted to stress that survival was not the experience of most Holocaust victims, and that stories told by the survivors told of exceptional or extraordinary circumstances. Despite this initial hesitancy, however, October Films convinced the Imperial War Museum that testimony on film would provide a vital element to the exhibition and enrich the Holocaust narrative provided. The selection of survivors chosen for inclusion um, was firstly based on their merits as speakers and presenters, rather than the stories they had to tell. A member of the Holocaust Project Office within the Imperial War Museum, Alison Murchie, was tasked with sourcing suitable candidates from the museum's sound archive. Suzanne Bargett believed in members of the Project Office working to their strengths. Coming from a family of actors, it was agreed that Alison would be best suited to identifying survivors that would connect with visitors to the exhibition. The requirements of the survivor were that they needed to speak English and that their voices be clear and well paced. This was so that visitors to the museum would not have to follow lengthy subtitling, but could hear and understand the voices of the survivors, even surrounded by distractions. Limiting the list of available testimonies even further, it was suggested that for, practi for practical reasons, the survivors should by and large live locally to the museum. 
This would be beneficial to the survivors and October Films when it came to recording the final video footage. The experience conveyed, and thus preserved by the museum, would be skewed towards experiences of those survivors choosing Britain as their post-war home, and more specifically, those living in London. Annie Dodds and James Barker had been present at each design meeting for the exhibition, so they were aware of how the testimonies were to fit within the exhibition space and with the overarching narrative. Dodds and Barker were able to adapt their questioning of the survivors to gain comments and feedback that would pull sections of the exhibition together. In terms of maintaining the integrity of the life stories, this would offer a way of structuring and reshaping the personal narratives of the survivors to reflect a master narrative prescribed by the exhibition. So I'm just going to explain in more detail, um, but I've uploaded the paper, you can just check this out. Can I round up? Seconds, bro. Uh, so, the experiences of Holocaust survivors in Britain are shaped to inform an accepted version of the Holocaust, a version that's given an authority through the National Curriculum and the Imperial War Museum. Uh, this is not apolitical. Survivor voices are employed to speak beyond their historical experiences and arguably beyond their capabilities. As we look towards the future of Holocaust testimonies, the politicisation of testimony has never been more relevant. As the United Kingdom prepares for a new dedicated Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre, situated symbolically alongside Parliament. The urgent recording and preservation of first generation survivor testimony continues with little thought to how this is going to be used. Prime Minister David Cameron has branded this a bold statement about the importance Britain places on preserving the memory of the Holocaust as a permanent affirmation of the values of British society. A possible site for the Learning Centre is the Imperial War Museum, for one sentence the creation of a new gallery dedicated to preserving memory of the Holocaust. It seems, however, this will be dedicated to memory of Britain in the Holocaust as interpreted through a framework of war. What challenges does this create for the future of Holocaust testimony, particularly in Britain, and how might this limit the rich and diverse potential of testimony beyond the framework of the British Holocaust witness? Yeah.